Contact with Chris Hedges. Welcome to On Contact. Today we discuss Islam and the modern world with the Islamic scholar Sheikh Hamza Yusuf. If a 9-11 event happened today, we would not see the type of responses that we saw. There won't be any flowers at the mosques. On contact. Neoliberalism, Neoliberalism is patriotism. Is patriotism. Truth, Truth is not a social and class war, corporate crudeta, utopian ideology of neoliberalism revolts on mass. On contact. On contact. On contact. With Chris Hedges. Islamic jihadists, like the Christian right, are religious heretics. They have far more in common with each other than they do with co-believers. They each sanctify violence. They see evil as embodied in other races they must exterminate. They believe any action that brings them closer to paradise on earth, no matter how cruel or barbaric, is justified. They have been vomited up from the wreckage of predatory global capitalism and empire, which has cast millions of the young adrift. They find in their fundamentalist beliefs a sanctification of their rage and victimhood. Becoming a Christian warrior, a jihadist, a champion of an absolute and pure ideal is an intoxicating conversion that lifts believers out of profound despair. These converts create a binary universe divided between good and evil. They believe they are anointed to change history by destroying power structures around them. They embrace a hyper-masculine violence as a cleansing agent for the world's contaminants, including those people who belong to other belief systems, races, and cultures. They are our new fascists. RT correspondent Anya Parampel examines the rise of Islamophobia in the U.S. since 9-11. In 2014, hate crimes in the United States decreased by 8%. That was the case across the board for all demographics, except Muslims. In 2014, hate crimes against Muslims rose by 14%. However, hate crimes targeting the Muslim community haven't always been so common. In the year 2000, they made up about 1.9% of hate crimes motivated by religion, while anti-Semitic attacks made up the majority. And while fortunately, over the years, the rate of anti-Semitic attacks have fallen, the number of hate crimes motivated by hatred of Muslims has risen to 16.1% of all religiously motivated hate crimes. But it's not just the fact that overall hate crimes are on the rise. Indeed, perhaps more concerning is the fact that according to polls, the overall sentiment in the United States towards Muslims is negative. According to a Pew poll this year, half of all Americans believe some Muslims are anti-American. And while 50% of them still say that they would like the candidates, the presidential candidates, to be careful when talking about religion, 40% of them do say that they'd like the candidates to be critical and blunt when talking about Islam. Meanwhile, the candidates aren't shying away from doing so, with both Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton characterizing attacks like the Orlando nightclub shooting earlier this year as radical Islamism. A study by Georgetown University this year concluded that the campaign season has contributed to a rise in Islamophobic attacks in 2015 and beyond. Tracing the increase to a surge in Islamophobic rhetoric in September of 2015, spearheaded by Republican nominee Donald Trump. But it's the media too. The report concludes that while Western media often portrays Muslims as the perpetrators of violence, in an increasingly hostile political atmosphere, in reality, they're the victims. Sheikh Hamza Youssef is America's most important Islamic scholar. He is the president of Zaytuna College, located in Berkeley, California. He is also an advisor to Stanford University's program in Islamic studies and the Center for Islamic Studies at Berkeley's Graduate Theological Union. Sheikh Hamza is the author of seven books, including Agenda to Change Our Condition and Prayer of the Oppressed. Thank you. Hamza. Thank you. I had just read this article that I mentioned to you by Jay Sakai. Uh, it's an excerpt from his book, Confronting Fascism, Discussion Documents for Militant Movement on the Web. It's called The Shock of Recognition. And he makes a very convincing case that the vacuum, the, both the spiritual and economic vacuum, that is sweeping across the globe because of neoliberalism and globalization is giving birth to a new fascism. 
And he includes in his analysis these Islamic groups, or let's call them so-called Islamic groups, I would call them heretics, uh, such as ISIS, Al-Qaeda. Well, I, th I think that fascism, as you know, has a broad spectrum of, of meaning. But if we use it to mean the idea of people that uh, believe that force is the only way in which an argument uh, is truly made. You know, there's a famous uh, statement about Mussolini that he got the trains to run on time for the first time in Italy. And the way he did it was by killing the, the engineers if they didn't actually get there on time. And, and so it's also the conflation of, of a, an economic system, a corporate system, the corporatization of government. And so, which was Mussolini's original vision. Right. So I think there are definitely fascistic elements that have emerged in, in the Muslim world, but a lot of it is, is from, first of all, massive suppression over many uh, decades with incredibly brutal governments that were fascistic by nature. And so, like uh, the purple tyrant, when, it, when he's crushed, uh, the one that crushes him becomes the tyrant. Let, let me go back, because pre-1948, mm -hmm. you had very strong democratic movements right. throughout the Muslim, the Muslim world, world in countries yeah. like Syria, yeah. Lebanon. And then with the, 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 the creation of the state of Israel, where you saw massive ethnic cleansing and the theft of lands of Palestinians. This is a country, Palestine, of course, that from the 7th century to 1948 had been Muslim. It gave credence to the proto-fascist, militaristic, anti-democratic forces. It was the best thing that ever happened right. to those forces. I, I would totally agree. And I think that the, the, the tragedy in, in the Arab world is that they, they were very inspired by America. Uh, and, and I think many Arabs really had this bright future. Uh, looking, looking forward, even Iran with with uh, Mossadegh yeah. and and the D, uh, you know, getting rid of the British influence and the colonial influences. So they saw America as this anti-colonial force in the world, the Wilsonian dream uh, of, of of a new world order where, where um, the, this sovereignty of the people would become realized. Well, and, and that's the tragedy, because right. Mossadegh in 1953, who, as you correctly point out, was, I think he worshipped Thomas Jefferson, right. was no, they, utterly betrayed. Right. By, by, by the Americans. By I the mean, CIA. Uh, yeah. Roosevelt, Kismet, yeah, uh, Kermit the, Roosevelt. Oversaw the coup. Right. The, all the Shah's men. Right. All right. on behalf of British patrol. Right. So I think that from that point of view, there, the, the, there's been an unrequited love affair with America, and I think 9-11 sealed the deal, because I just was with an Egyptian taxi driver who said, you know, I asked him, were you here during 9-11? He said, yeah, and I said, what do you think it was? Well, he said, in Lebanon, we say, hit me so I can beat the crap out of you. <laughs> and so it becomes an excuse, right. really, to, um, uh, to brutalize people that really had nothing to do with, with anything. Yeah. One of the tragedies that I've seen throughout the Muslim world is the assault against traditional Sufi right. Islam. Right. And I think it's fairly well documented that Wahhabism, which has fed ideologically uh, many of these movements we see, and of course with Saudi money, was certainly at its inception promoted by Western interests. Uh, I think during the Ottoman Empire, the, the British stoked Wahhabism as a way to fight against Sufi influence. And, and, and of course, the, the current ruling Saudi family has embraced it. Uh, we saw the oil deals uh, in the early 1930s, uh, you know, even to the point of American oil companies paying for the publication of Wahhabist literature and because of the financial resources, this has poisoned much of the religious discourse, uh, I think you would agree, throughout not only the Muslim world, but even beyond. Well, I think what's happened, the, 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 I think the traditionalists, what we'd call the traditionalists, which certainly Sufism was a, a, a large part of classical Islamic tradition, the, the traditionalists have never dealt with the fact that they, they ossified into a very sterile 
tradition with a lot of, it was no longer a living tradition. You know, in Catholicism, they, they differentiate between tradition and traditionalism. The tradition is the, the living faith of the dead. Traditionalism is the dead faith of the living. And in many ways, they are, uh, this is what happened. And so there were reactions to that. Uh, what's called Wahhabism, they don't like to be called Wahhabis, but what's called Wahhabism was actually a, a type of Protestant reformist movement um, in, in uh, Arabia that eventually allied with uh, a, a political force, uh, Al Saud. And so the religious and the political became allied in this. And, and because of the petrodollars, they were able to spread a, a, a very different type of Islam that most of the Muslim world was comfortable with. But a couple of things that I have to say, and I think this is really important, um, the, 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 the scholars the, of, of uh, the Saudi Arabian Kingdom have consistently been against suicide bombing. And this is not true of the Sunni scholars generally. Huh. The, they have consistently, there is no Saudi scholar outside of the heretical ones, even within no, their own tradition. It should be clear that suicide is, is prohibited It's in prohibited Quran, in Islam. In the, in, right. and, 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 and they are the only ones that, that really stuck to that, other than some Sufis generally didn't. But most of the, the, the Sunni scholarship, I felt completely sold out on that issue. And, and if you read their fatwas, it's all emotional. There's no rational argument. It's all about Palestine, and this is our right. only way. I have a friend who well, said- this is what Osama bin Laden did, who had no religious legitimacy to no issue No religious fatwas. training at all. And so, I mean, you know The Devil's Game, uh, Dreyfus's right. book, right. which is a very important book. And, and I would argue there's a few that, books- that We should say what that is. The Devil's Game it, argues- It's about how America really funded uh, Islamic fundamentalism because they were so worried about Russian influence uh, in the region. And, and um, we're talking about the war in uh, Afghanistan. Ma many, many places. Because well, there's a lot of proxy wars and then there's also a lot of other stuff going on. But if you really want to take it back, I think you have to go back to David Frompkin's The Peace to End All yeah, Peace it's a great book. And, and recognize that World War I never ended. Right. And that the Middle East was a front. It, the, you know, it was the Middle Eastern front during World War I. Right. Iraq was a big part of right. that. World War II is a direct result of the Versailles Treaty, right. that the humiliation of the German people. You would not have had. Hitler and the rise of, of Hitler without the, uh, the, the collapse of the, the, the Deutschmark because of the Weimar Republic and, and the incredible humiliation that, was, uh, that was, they were faced with. Great. When we come back, we'll hear more from Islamic scholar Sheikh Hamza Yusuf. Welcome back to On Contact. We'll continue our conversation with Islamic scholar and president of Zaytuna College, Sheikh Hamza Youssef. Let's talk about what's been happening to disenfranchise Muslim youth, both in Europe and the banlieues of France, where people are mostly North African Muslims, five million segregated. I've been to those banlieues, the Cité de Cadmille and others. The French prisons are filled with North African, disproportionately with North African Muslims in the way that our prisons are filled with poor people of color. Uh, the racism is overt in countries like Belgium. Despair, loss of hope. Uh, and this is also true in huge swaths of the Muslim world itself, which has not been exempt from predatory capitalism. And one of the things you once said to me that I think is true, having spent a lot of time in the Middle East, is that so many of the people who are seduced by this ideology have a kind of loss of identity or struggle, but right. they also don't come out of religious backgrounds. Yeah. You will, you will almost never find a religiously educated, and if they are, they're autodidacts, mm. or they've come out of, a, of an extremist tradition already. 
if you can call it a tradition. Um, you will not find the madrasas, which are always being blamed for producing right. these people. In the madrasas, these are these are the Islamic schools. Right, the Islamic Many colleges. Many of them in countries like Pakistan, right, funded are, by the Saudis. What, some of them, yeah, certainly, but but many of them are still traditional schools. Like I studied in a madrasa, and it was Aristotelian logic and rhetoric and, and things like that. This but, was in Mauritania. In Mauritania, yeah, right. in Morocco. But if you look, you know, Europe is is very different from the United States. The, Europe, the the immigration to Europe were, were, was the result of the uh, of the after effects of World War II because they brought in a lot of Muslims to rebuild Europe. Europe was devastated, as you know. Uh, London was uh, aerial bombardment. Liverpool. So they brought in a lot of their you know the colonial uh, the peoples to do all the labor and work. So these were not educated people. Whereas in the United States, immigration has been, it was a Cold War immigration. And so it was the brain drain from the Muslim world. So many of the most highly skilled and educated uh, Muslims came to America. That's why we have so many doctors and engineers. And, and so they're very different communities. The American community, Muslim community, is actually doing quite well. I mean, economically. The, economically. And so, and, and many of them feel very comfortable here. They feel fr enfranchised because the, the, in America, you can, you can come to America and you can become an American in about five years. And then generally, most Americans, I mean, we have a lot of racism, but most Americans accept the immigrant traditionally. I mean, we've got a lot of anti-immigrant rhetoric right now for, for many reasons. So I think they're very different. But in Europe, you're dealing with profoundly disenfranchised people that have never been allowed to become French. They've never been allowed to become uh, English. They don't feel English. They don't right. feel French. And so with the racism... Let me just add there that when you know they go back to Algeria or Tunisia, and they may have been born there and left as a... They don't feel Algerian they don't feel or Tunisian Algerian. either. This is, this, is, this is exactly it. They, the identity is in crises. Right. And so the third group, which is the extremist group, come join us and be part of this brotherhood. It's like a gang. And when you have in the African-American inner cities, a gang is membership. And so many of the African-American youth or Hispanic youth are pulled into these, or skinheads, white, some right. disenfranchised white youth that are pulled into the, the uh, white gang mentality. And of course, if we look at the history of many of the people who have carried out acts of terrorism in Europe, they come out of a petty and often petty not crime. even petty cr yeah, criminal or, or, class. Exactly, criminal class. I, I have said the same thing. The same thing is true here. Many of these people, we have a large conversion rate in prisons. And if those people aren't nurtured and cared for because they've grown up in very difficult situations, and if they're given a rhetoric of rage, if they're given a, a, a divinely legitimized version of reality that otherizes uh, all of these people, they can become an incredibly dangerous uh, force, and, and that's happened. But again, I want to point out that when you look at the numbers, these are very small numbers. Right. It's so exaggerated. Right. We have 15,000 people die every year from low tire pressure in America. And, and the numbers of people that have gone overseas from America, you're looking at less than 1,000 people. If you look at the overall Muslim community, it's probably close to 10 million with the children. It's a very insignificant number, and yet it's blown out of with the... With well, the let's talk about that, because it has been used, especially since 9-11, to stoke what I find to be a very frightening Islamophobia that includes, within mainstream discourse, a demonization of Muslims. Right. Well, you know, because I think of all people, you probably know more than anybody in this country what happens when you demonize people, because it's always the the predecessor to uh, to great violence against those people. And, and I think you've seen that in many places around the world. And so it is deeply troubling. I'm, I have some optimism because I'm always struck by the fact that there is a profound goodness that resides in the hearts of a lot of people in this country. And, and, and what I saw after 9-11, because I actually predicted all of this, I thought it was going to happen within one or two years after 9-11. The fact that it took over 10 years of an incredibly massive You're machine. about the kind of hate talk. The hate that, talk. Right. It took a long time right. to transform. But it, it did in Nazi Germany as well. I know. Towards the Jews. That's true. And it, it took, 
Hitler only, between 1933 and 1938, he mentioned the Jews three times, according right. to Claudia, Claudia right. Kunz, yeah. But don't, I, I know, but I, I think also the Jews, um, there was a, a deep problem, and Mark Twain addresses that in Concerning the Jews. There was a deep anti-Semitism in the German psyche uh, prior to uh, Hitler. But not a lethal anti-Semitism. That's true. That's true. I mean, anti-Semitism came with Luther. Trust me, I'm deeply <laughs> disturbed by it. And I sometimes I sit around with some of my Muslim friends and say, do you think we're like Jews in 1933? Like, how bad can it get? You know, I mean, I really do every once in a while say that. And, and we have a tradition of our prophet that said, you are most like the Jews, and you will follow them handspan by handspan. Well, I don't want to see Muslims end up in these internment camps. But the Japanese internment happened. And if there was a, 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 a bad strike here, a dirty bomb or right. something, it's, I think but don't people- don't you think rhetorically we've laid the ground for that? Oh, absolutely. Of, yeah. I, yeah, I'm, I'm convinced that if a 9-11 event happened today, we would not see the type of responses that we saw. There won't be any flowers at the mosques. Right. Yeah. I, uh, as you know, sued President Obama over Section 1021 of the National Defense Authorization Act, which overturns the 1878 Posse Comitatus Act prohibiting the military from carrying out domestic policing. And judge, we won in the Southern District wow. Court of New York. Uh, uh, the Obama administration appealed in the Second Circuit. They refused to accept my standing, didn't hear the case, because it is patently unconstitutional. But Judge Catherine B. Forrest, who ruled in our favor, when she wrote her opinion, which is worth reading on the Internet, said that this opens the way for the government to criminalize an entire category of people, and she brought up the 110,000 Japanese Americans who were interned, stripped of their rights, U.S. citizens, in World War II. So legally, we've already created, but rhetorically, we've created the conditions, and legally, we've created the conditions. Right. Yeah. And, and, and apparently, in order for that to be overturned, it has to happen again. So because that's never really been dealt with, the Japanese internment. Well, it now is, it, it, the, the government can, in essence, if you read Section 1021, carry out extraordinary rendition right. on the streets of American cities, it's, hold people in military facilities, strip no, them of due process, i.e., yeah. they I don't, don't think order. people don't realize what's happened. I mean, the, the, the type of changes that have happened. I think one of the things that we, uh, as, as believers, certainly, um, you know, we believe that there's another force working in the world greater than their force. And, absurdity of faith. <laughs> and it, well, maybe so, but a leap of faith. But 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 I I I, I do believe that um, that we 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 worship a a just God, who tempers his justice with great benevolence, and and that that these things do have a reckoning, they do have a reckoning that civilizations cannot uh, justice even if it's. The, the type of relative justice of the world. Justice is what enables and empowers civilizations. And as they lose uh, that, that striving for the truth, you know, one of the things that the Quran says, we don't destroy a people as long as there is amongst them people fighting for the truth. And, and so a society can be unjust, but if you have within it people that are fighting against that injustice, that's one of the reasons God will sustain that people. And I think there are still a lot of people in this country, and you're certainly one of them, that, that is speaking uh, that truth. And as long as we have those people, I think that, that we have some hope and, and optimism that, that there's, there, there is that divine force that will sustain us. Well, in secular terms, that's Václav Havel's The Power of the Powerless, in which he quite he uses that I, I wrote phrase, living in book, truth. I wrote The Prayer of the Oppressed. I know. That, that, that the, the oppressed have a power that they, they don't realize. Right. And the numbers are on our side, despite the fact that the military might is on the other side. But that military might, until they get their robotics in place, which is a terrifying, that is. And you know, C.S. Lewis predicted uh, transhumanism right. predicted the abolition of man I think is one of the most important books for people to read because another one is Lewis Mumford which nobody right. reads anymore you know no, the Pentagon of Power yeah, I yeah. mean Mumford saw this stuff coming you know we talked about Kierkegaard's the creeping villainy yes you know vice yes. is is a monster of frightful mean as to be hated uh, needs but to be seen but seen too oft familiar with her face we first pity then endure then embrace that was Islamic scholar and president of Zaytuna College, Sheikh Hamza Yusuf. 
Revenge is the psychological engine of all campaigns of terror. Victims are the blood currency. Their corpses are used to sanctify acts of indiscriminate slaughter. Those defined as the enemy are rendered inhuman. They are not worthy of empathy or justice. Pity and grief are felt exclusively for our own. We vow to eradicate a dehumanized mass that embodies absolute evil. Christian fanatics embrace the concept of holy war as fervently as Islamic fanatics. Our crusades are matched by the concept of jihad. Once religion is used to sanctify murder, there are no rules. It is a battle between light and dark, good and evil, Satan and God. Rational discourse is banished, and the sleep of reason, as Goya said, always brings forth monsters. Thank you for watching. You can find us on rt.com slash oncontact. Until next week.